the promised story. It was my first experience of sacramental confession, at least my first that really counts, guided by a priest who understood the significance of sacramental confession and absolution. It was nearly 40 years ago, and I was making the annual prayer retreat that my theological co college required of all its students. I had chosen to make my retreat at the convent of the incarnation of the Sisters of the Love of God in Oxford. And the priest who normally heard the sisters' confessions agreed to hear mine. You may have heard it said that hearing the confession of cloistered nuns is like being stoned to death with cotton balls. Perhaps the load I dumped in that chapel was heavier than the priest had expected because he looked a little shaken as he offered me spiritual counsel, pronounced absolution, and gave me my penance. I was to sit in chapel and repeat Psalm 23. I felt somewhat the way Nam and the Syrian commander did when Elijah told him to go take a dip in the Jordan in order to be cleansed from his leprosy. Is that all? If he had asked for something difficult, I would have done it. But what was to be gained from repeating that innocuous, overused psalm, which says nothing at all about sin or contrition, and too often leads preachers to make lightly informed reflections on the habits and disposition of sheep. <laughs> I was even surprised to discover that I had paid it enough attention to be able to recite tw Psalm 23 from memory. Yet as soon as I started repeating it, I began to realize that the priest who assigned it for my penance knew what he was doing. He had given me milk, not meat. Having no personal knowledge of me apart from the confession, he nonetheless had correctly discerned that while I might at that point have had some decent knowledge of academic theology and biblical studies, I knew little about the life of prayer. I might have given a passable linguistic analysis of the Hebrew text of the psalm, but I had no idea why it is in the Bible, how it might speak a word of hope and guidance, even a life-changing word, as it has done for others no more likely than I, including Eldridge Cleaver on the lamb in France from the Oakland police. As you know, that sort of discovery is never a one-time event for anyone. And so this evening, let's refresh our corporate memory and look together at how Psalm 23 may be for us a song of healing. What stands out in this psalm is the complete lack of anxiety in the midst of trouble. The psalmists, as we've discussed, normally express their anxiety freely to God through dozens of laments. But this psalmist's freedom is of a different order altogether. It is not that she feels free to, uh, feels free to articulate anxiety, but rather that she is free from having any anxiety to express. And her freedom does not depend on favorable circumstances. To the contrary, even though I walk through a valley dark as death, I shall not fear evil. You might suppose that to be naivete or bravado, and probably I did suppose that when I formerly thought there was little to commend this psalm as a remedy for my own spiritual ills. But I was wrong. This psalm comes from someone who has known fear and faced it 
down. And now in six simple verses, she speaks to the root causes of anxiety that are common to human existence in any age and every place. The Lord is my shepherd. I want for nothing. With that opening line, the psalmist repudiates the profound sense of existential need that is the condition of life for some in our culture and even in the church, a condition to which almost all of us revert with frequency, the bottomless, boundless sense of not enough. I don't have enough. I am not sophisticated enough or attractive enough. I am not smart enough and I don't know enough. That version of not enough is especially plaguing for academics. In short, I am not enough. The condition of existential want is a vast abyss. And more achievement, more income, more professional recognition and personal affirmation never, ever suffices to fill it. Setting aside, then, the glittering delusion of more, the psalmist pronounces the only effective remedy, the only affirmation that can, in fact, free us from the anxiety of never enough. Adonai ro'i, the Lord is my shepherd, therefore I lack nothing. But just how is that remedy effective in real human circumstances? Our own or those of Jesus' first disciples, whom he sends out as too few shepherds to masses of harassed and helpless sheep. The next moment, the disciples are themselves sheep, going out into the middle of wolves. And Jesus says, don't worry about it. Why not worry? The answer lies in hearing this psalm as Jesus and his contemporaries might have heard it which is somewhat more complex than the way most of us moderns are likely to read it. If the ancients were better attuned to this psalm, as I suspect they were, it is not because they knew a lot more about the actual work of shepherding than most of us do. That is true, but mostly irrelevant here. More importantly, they would have heard the metaphor of God as shepherd as a complex statement operating at more than one level because in ancient Israel and its neighboring societies, shepherding was not only a daily reality but also a metaphor for kingship. The human ruler was described in songs and visual depictions as the shepherd of the people. In the Bible, Moses and David are the main examples. The royal scepter was a shepherd's staff par excellence. And in Hebrew, the same word shevet means both staff and, and scepter. So when the ancients heard or repeated that assertion, it is the Lord who is my shepherd. They were making a claim at two different levels. First, the existential or pastoral level. God tends me as a shepherd tends sheep. And second, at the public or political level, as a statement about power. God is my sovereign and is God is my sovereign and sovereign shepherd of my people. 
So let's reread the psalm with both the political and the existential aspects of the metaphor in view, because both are necessary if the disciples of Jesus, then and now, are to be adequately defended against fear in all facets of our lives. We begin with an existential understanding of the metaphor, which is doubtless what my confessor wished me to hear all those years ago. With the assertion that God tends each of us like a valued yet vulnerable sheep, the psalmist addresses several closely related aspects of fear. I am guessing you will recognize them all from your own experience and that of your people. The fear of floundering, of having no direction. The fear of isolation, of being fundamentally alone. And the fear of humiliation. The Lord is my shepherd. As a theology student, repeating those words as a penance in the convent chapel, I heard them speaking directly to my own painful floundering. I had no vision for what lay beyond seminary. I had neither found a vocation nor been, nor been found by one. And my sins came out of my floundering. Like a panicked swimmer, I was a danger to myself and others around me. Of course, it is not just the young who flounder. I think of the homemaker now with an empty house, or the retired person, suddenly deprived of any sense of purpose, or the active professional who has discovered the hollowness of her own success. Institutions, too, can founder, be it, be it a church, a university, or at the limit, a nation that has no identity other than being important, no sense of mission other than wanting to be great. To all of us, the psalmist offers the reorienting word that God brings me back to life. The Hebrew is that strong and leads me along the right paths for the sake of his name. There is a right path forward for me out of a death-like existence. And most remarkably, it is for the sake of God's name. Though it far exceeds my current imagination, I can believe that my restoration to a full life somehow makes a difference for God. My walking on a just path enhances God's holy name, God's recognizable presence in our world. Further, I can trust that I will be led toward a productive life along the right path. Because as the psalmist says, now turning directly to God, you are with me. I am not fundamentally alone as I negotiate this fearful situation, whatever it might be. Psalm 23 was used often for communion services during the London Blitz bombing 75 years ago. But even in the less dire circumstances that attend most of our days, we are much in need of the comfort afforded by its picture of how God is present with me. God in this psalm looks like an Israelite host receiving a highly honored guest, setting the table, soothing my sun-parched head and, feet and face 
with softening cleansing oil, giving wine from a brimming cup. This extravagant divine hospitality frees me from isolation. And what is more, it is offered in the plain sight of my opponents. That is how the psalmist speaks to my perennial fear of humiliation. And I am guessing none of us is entirely immune to that fear. It is said, as you probably know, that clergy have an unusually high need for approval. So who are those op opponents before whom God shows me such generosity? Surely they are the people whose own attitude toward me is not generous, perhaps not sworn enemies, but the people by whom I feel judged, who do not hesitate to note my failings, whose look or comment makes me feel just a shade inadequate. We all have such people in our lives, and sometimes at very close quarters. And then there are the internal opponents, the misplaced guilt that plagues me, or the real guilt, long ago confessed and forgiven, and yet it lingers, stopping me from moving on to new life. There are other internalized voices, more cruel and insistent than any external enemy, that tell me plainly I am not good enough and never will be. But God's generosity toward me flies in the face of all those opponents, calling me back to life. God's goodness and mercy chases me down, does not let me escape into self-blame and perpetual self-doubt, chases me all through the years and all the way home. I will dwell in the Lord's house for length of days. At the existential level, then, this is a psalm of the most profound comfort. It speaks to my fears of floundering, of isolation, and of humiliation, with a voice more insistent than those of my opponents' external and internal. At the same time, this psalm demands something of me. It is a psalm of comfort, but not of complacency. And that is because God is not only a pastoral shepherd, but also a sovereign. And we are not just sheep, but also citizens, members of a commonwealth. If indeed we are to dwell in God's house for length of days, then as members of the household, we have responsibilities to carry out there. So now we have come to the public and political ramifications of this psalm. How it confronts us, subtly but surely, with the question of power and how we are to reckon with power as members of the household of God. Of course, the pastoral and political dimensions of the psalm are not really separate. If my pastoral shepherd brings me back to life and sets me on a productive path, then God, my sovereign shepherd, has a right to expect something of me. And having some history with God, as individuals and as a church, we know that what God expects may be difficult. 
in the words of a wonderful Eucharistic prayer from the American prayer book, this psalm will not let us rest in the presumption of coming to God for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. The psalm gives solace and at the same time requires of us strength and courage. To use an old-fashioned Christian word that is still extremely useful, this is a psalm of fortitude, no less than of comfort. Fortitude was, for some centuries, understood as an essential virtue that the community of faith needed to cultivate because Christians and Jews knew from bitter experience that if you accept the central claim of this psalm, that the God to whom the Bible testifies is the sovereign reality in our life, if you accept that, then you will have trouble with other potentates seeking to assert their own power. It is entirely likely that Jesus had this psalm in mind when he told his disciples, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, but it's okay. They can kill you, sure, but they have no power over your soul. Just remember this. Adonai Roi, God is my sovereign shepherd. I want for nothing. That certain knowledge of God is what the sages of Proverbs call the root of the righteous that cannot be moved. It is the deep tap root into reality that enables the righteous to stand firm against fear, to practice fortitude. Many North American Christians have gotten out of the habit of thinking about the need to practice fortitude because the church, at least the Euro-American church, has long had the luxury of being on fairly good terms with the potentates. The potentates are with us, among us, And if we have not always agreed with them on every political issue, nonetheless, many of us felt, however wrongly, that in the practice of our faith, we could bracket the big issues of power. But as my colleague Stanley Hauerwas points out, the one advantage of the current political and economic situation, at least on our side of the border, is that it clarifies what the church is for. When power is abused, then Christians and other persons of faith must take more careful measure of God's power, stand against fear and testify with whatever opportunities and means are available to us. Two weeks ago, we saw an unusually explicit and public example of Christian fortitude in Senator Romney's testimony to the sovereign reality of God before voting against his party in the most consequential political action of his political career. My own country's current situation throws into high relief the need to take the measure of God's power and practice fortitude. But I do not think it makes American Christians unique. Surely the various dimensions of our global situation, not least climate crisis, makes that need clear enough for Christians on this side of the border and everywhere else. So this is the question for us now. What acts of fortitude does the sovereign reality of God require of me 
in this time, in my situation? That is a worthy question to occupy us this Lent and this hour as we come to this table, not for solace only, but also for strength, not for pardon only, but also for renewal. May God grant us the courage to ask and the fortitude to listen for the answer God has to give. Amen.